to start. Uh, this one we welcome to uh, Climate Action Coffee. Uh, we meet here every Wednesday morning. We have a time change. Good for some, great for others. Uh, seven, it's going from 7 to 8, so we're going to be meeting here at 8 a.m. Uh, every Wednesday morning. And uh, Climate Action Coffee is part of Cali, which is the Tacoma Alliance for Local Living Economy, which is part of the Tacoma Park Mobilization. And if you want to talk about any of those groups, you can come up afterwards and we'll talk to you about it. Uh, the bathrooms are out around and to the right. And the coffee is available. There are breakfast menus on your table that you may order throughout the event. The kitchen will open at 8. Oh, okay. I didn't want to keep reminding you of that. Did, so. did you get into the Wi-Fi? Yes, I got it. Okay, they got it. I wanted to take a, a note here about TV mobilizations group uh, agreements. We assume good intent. When we're not here to do battle, we assume that people are going down the same road as we are. If we find that people aren't, we'll ask them to join another group. Uh, if you move up and move back, if you are a talker, Please step back and let those who don't often talk, we encourage them to talk, so give them room to do that. Uh, we like to respect and listen. Listening is as important as talking, and we, not, we do a lot of listening here because there's a lot of good folks, especially when we bring in resource people, thank you resource people. Uh, no hate speech. Use appropriate language. Sometimes your cuss word is appropriate. <laughs> uh, embrace the journey. This, this is the journey of our life. Uh, climate change is not going to go away. Uh, it's going to be something that we have to work through our lifetimes. Our children are going to have to work through their lifetimes. And probably our grandchildren. So embrace that journey. Don't wear yourself out. We're here for the long haul. Um, make sure we support each other. This is not going to be an easy journey. So, having said all of that, oh, one more thing. Up here, I have some, hey, I'm a paper person. <laughs> There's a, a place for climate organizations. Please come and put down any organizations that you're part of or that you think we should be aware of. Uh, and over here, any meetings of other groups. So, if there's other meetings going on throughout the month, just come up and give them to us so that we can all uh, go to those if they appeal to us. Would you want to point to that one as well? Or? Oh, these are our principles for TV mobilizations, and you can kind of take a look at those later. Uh, those are basically how we organize, why we organize, and what we focus on. So, having... A couple weeks ago, Alexis Bade Mayor pointed out that Jeremy Rifkin has a book on the Green New Deal. I've just got a copy of anybody else to look at it. Pass it around. Okay, so now we're going to pass this over to Galen for our conference. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'd like you all to just um, take a glance around the room and look at the faces of all the other people who have gotten up early on Wednesday morning to come here. <coughs> Hi, Kathy. <laughs> The people you know, the people you don't know yet. And then close your eyes. Feel your breath moving. Allow to come to your mind the reason why you're here today. Acknowledge the importance of coming here, being in community with other people, learning about what we can do, to address the climate crisis and move ahead into a better world. Big breath in, 
And as you exhale, just open your eyes and come back to the room. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. And uh, thanks, Karen, for your wise words. Uh, so, welcome to the uh, Climate Action Coffee House this morning. My name is Larry Martin. I'm the moderator for today's panel. We'll be talking about the public bank. Uh, on the panel today, we've got Michael Brennan, uh, Dan Robinson, Hugh um, Choicer. And uh, Thomas Dale. Now, if you see the done in front of the room, people can speak. The um, general approach, I think, is to save questions to the end, uh, so everyone has a chance to kind of get the ideas out. And uh, we'll have plenty of time for that. We're asking each speaker to talk for maybe eight to ten minutes, and, uh, and we'll uh, have a couple of uh, sort of initial prompting questions, and then open it up. So one thing I just wanted to observe before we get started is, unlike a lot of the issues that, that we've worked on, many of us all our lives, uh, that have an immediate outcome, whether it's uh, you know, stopping a war, or uh, ending nuclear power, or fighting climate change, global warming, a public bank is, is not so much an ends as it is a means. So today, when we, uh, when we talk about the public bank, I think we'll be certainly discussing what the public bank is and how it can be used, but also what we can use it for. Um, and so with that, our first speaker is uh, Michael Brennan. He's a graduate student at the University of Maryland in uh, public administration. Did I get that right? Public policy. Public policy. And uh, is a, uh, a budding expert on public bank. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, so for my undergraduate degree and my, my capstone project is in the public banking, it's been a very formative experience. I got involved in the economic democracy issues from working at the Maryland Food Co-op at the University of Maryland, um, and unfortunately got shut down in May. Um, so that's where I met Suzanne, and um, when we were fighting the administration trying to keep it open, and we've stayed in touch since. Um, but it informed my sense about dire need for building resilient local economies, and then that led to my interest in how do we finance building resilient local economies, and I think that's kind of the question I came here with, and I hope you guys thinking about this. Um, why are we here? I think that's, that's, that's my intent, um, is to think about how do, we, how do we put those pieces together, um, and the public bank is going to be a key part of that. <coughs> so what is public bank? Broadly, it would be a bank that's owned uh, or is governed by the people through their representative government. Um, and this would be narrowed down to a few different areas. Um, so first would be central banking, which I think is what a lot of people think of when they think about the public bank. So in the US, we have the Federal Reserve System, um, established in 1913. Um, the legislation is not really public or private. It's a weird middle ground. It says it's the US monetary policy. Um, and what it does is provide short-term loans uh, between banks to ensure each has enough cash in reserves and will buy U.S. Treasury securities. Um, and but it was independent institution authorized by Congress, which means it can be decided that it can be revoked by Congress if it chose to. Um, so we'll think about that in the future. So another popular proposal for public banks um, would be a postal banking system. This is something proposed by Senator Sanders and Gillibrand. Where you would uh, turn existing post offices into uh, retail banks, um, offer basic banking services through that. Um, so that would be basic checking and savings accounts, micro loans, debit cards, wire transfers. It wouldn't do lending services, but um, it would <coughs> help serve the other banks, especially rural communities. Um, and that would be on the federal level through the post office, which is through the executive. Um, so the third and the one we're talking about today are commercial banks, and that's typically what we interact with. So that's retail services, what we just laid out, um, and then commercial services and lending to businesses and individuals, um, and also financial services to investors, so um, helping connect uh, investors to markets. Uh, so when we think about public banking legislation on the state level, um, there's a few different ways we can think, a few different ways we can break down that category of a state level public bank. Um, 
So the first is, you know, if we're trying to pass a state legislation, um, you can either have um, a state level bank, right? One of them, say, by the state of Maryland, or you can have uh, the state pass legislation to authorize municipal banks, like the Bank of Montgomery County, Park Park. Um, and those are two different models that are ascendant right now. Those are distinct things. So, for example, the Bank of North Dakota, which is the one we've been talking about, it's been it's in business for um, 100 years now. That's a state level bank. Um, and then last year it was the first big win for public banking in 100 years um, when they passed legislation in California to create uh, 10 new public banks over the next seven years. And those would be municipal, regional, or county banks and not a state level bank. Um, so those are different models. New Jersey, in November, Governor Phil Murphy announced he was creating a task force to create a business plan for a state level bank. So he would be following the North Dakota model. And um, what he's actually doing is going a step beyond California because California did enabling legislation. They created the ability to for cities to create banks, whereas he is they're creating a business plan to create a bank in the next year or two. Um, so they're moving forward with that. Um, West Virginia is currently has a public banking movement. Um, they have a group called West Virginia Can't Wait. Um, that's one of the progressive populist uh, um, campaigns for 2020 and public banking is one of their central parts. Um, they're, they're focused on the state level bank. New York City um, is focused on passing state legislation to create a New York City slash municipal bank. So you can break it out that way. Um, and then the second category to kind of break this out into would be uh, direct lending versus partner lending. Um, so it depends on the scale. So if you're a state level bank, and this is kind of the Bank of North Dakota model, it would be much more difficult to offer direct services to people, say like lending, um, because it takes on a lot more operational costs or overhead costs in order to administer loans, um, kind of interact with people on a day-to-day -day basis. And so the Bank of North Dakota, what they've done, um, and it, this isn't exclusive to public bank, but we can probably speak to this for a Park County Green Bank, um, but uh, you have partnership loans where um, another lender will originate the loan and then you will help extend credit and uh, um, kind of give, give the, make the ability for that um, original lender uh, to give out credit to expand credit. Uh, um, assuming good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it, it, ex it expands their capacity to lend pretty much because um, they don't have to have as much capital as they would need in order to lend pretty straightforwardly, I think. Um, and, uh, but also, like, a state bank would not be able to create like enough physical branches in the state, right? If you have, if you were going to offer direct services, you'd have to create like locations all over the state, and that would be way too much overhead for them to be able to take on. So, if you have a state bank, um, you would be able to administer it through local lenders. Um, so, but if also if you have a state level bank, another proposal, and this is also from a separate thing, is something called um, an inclusive value ledger, which is a proposal in New York State as well um, to create an electronic banking system through um, what they're calling it like a public Venmo. So Venmo is like a um, like an electronic cash transfer app. And rather than receiving your tax credits or your transfers you get from the government through various programs, you receive it through this app, and then this app would be um, pretty much like an electronic like bank because because you're deferring your payment from the government and you just have it in this credit system that exists on your phone. You are lending to the state, and you're earning interest on your on your credit, and then you can transfer it to other people or for goods and services. It's kind of a separate thing, but like the if you have a state level bank, you can build this into it so that you also provide retail banking services that way. Kind of covering a lot of ground at once. So I'm sorry if this is confusing. Let me know if there's something you're like, wait, go back. That's helpful. So, um, Bank of North Dakota um, um, is kind of our precedent. That's kind of what we have to go off of in terms of why should we support public banking and what we're arguing with people about why we need public banks. This is kind of what we have to go off. So, uh, can public banks provide the same return as private banks? Is kind of the question people pose. And Bank of North Dakota um, has kind of proven this in 2014 is return on assets, which is kind of a standard measure of bank performance. Um, they have 
1.54 percent um, compared to the national average, which is 1.01 percent. Um, how does it serve the public good? Um, so over the last 20 years, the Bank of North Dakota has made 385 million dollars in payments to the general fund, um, and that has helped foster uh, a resilient economy and state in the face of the 2008 financial crisis. I think this is a really important point. Um, so it's kind of background. There's banking deregulation that culminated the last legal repeal in 1999, which allowed commercial banks to do investment banking. So kind of oh, there I got to run through this kind of quickly. Um, anyway, banking deregulation um, created a lot of problems. Community banks uh, were getting kind of squeezed out of the market. Um, and once the financial crash hits, credit dries up, and then people aren't able to kind of do the counter cyclical lending, which is a really important way to get out of a financial crisis. So North Dakota had the most community banks per capital, they had the most community bank lending per capital, small and medium bank lending per capital, per capital sorry. Um, and they had the lowest, so in the crisis, July 2008 to 2011, um, they had the lowest unemployment rate in the country, they had the highest growth rate in the country at 5.2%, Texas had a second at 2.6%. Um, and they were the only state that had continuous budget surplus before and after the crisis. They never went into a deficit um, because they had those transfers from the bank. Yeah, yeah fracking. Yes, and there's so, yeah, and it's a good point because it's not to say that North Dakota is this ideal model. A lot of it is dependent on the oil boom and the shale boom. Bank of North Dakota is instrumental in their ability to do that. So this is like there's some contradiction <coughs> what we're talking about. This that's important as well. But how does that relate to climate finance, right? Um, and I'll get into maybe the other stuff when we go into questions. Um, but um, so in 2015, in terms of just total global climate finance, there was 472 billion dollars. About half of that was from private finance, and about half of that was from from assets held in public banks, right? From pu the public banking sector through Europe and China, and, and generally. Um, so it's 50-50, um, but bank public banks only control 20% of assets. So they're really pulling the weight on total climate, global climate finance, and in order for um, the market to really shift that way, it's, it's kind of driven by Institutions that can really say, okay, this is what's in the public goods interest or the public interest, and can make the private market follow it. It's not like the private market's leading them; the public is following. It's the public that's leading it, and the private's following. Um, so, the, one of the main arguments, I guess, I'll, I'll end with this, but because there's kind of more here, is um, that for climate finance to really become the mainstream rather than like the fringe, I think uh, public finance and public banking has to be on the front end rather than on the back end, and that public banking. Uh, local, state, federal level for those who should know. Good. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Um, next on the panel. <laughs> next on the panel is Dan Robinson. Uh, Dan is an activist and entrepreneur. He's a leader of the Tacoma Park uh, Credit Union Initiative, and many of you all may know him as uh, your ex city council member. Uh, Dan. Hi. Um, I'm honored to be amongst all of you and amongst all these uh, on the panelists. And uh, I'm going to tell a story, my story, in a few minutes. And uh, so I'm going to read it. Um, so I'm not either a professional nor an expert on banking. I do have experience as a business person who used my own personal funds and collateral to approach a number of banks and state funding agencies for a specific project. And I have some knowledge of cooperatives and the difficulties they face in accessing funding. Uh, cooperatives come in many flavors, but at bottom, they are organizations with democratic management. This group, HAL, uh, could be considered a collaborative because it is not an organization with, uh, well, I'll say, rules of governance, although there certainly are some rules of governance. Um, but cooperatives are typically businesses. Though, if you compare structure, you'll see many similarities between what are called consumer co-ops and governments. When consumers own this co-op, like Tacoma Park and Silver Springs include co-op, shoppers, who own as patrons, get a vote and elect a board, who in turn hires staff. The city of Tacoma 
park is structured the same way. Residents get a vote, they hire a board, who in turn hire staff. The, the difference between a consumer, consumer co-op and a government co is that a government has the legal power to set mandatory fees and taxes for services, which provide a predict predictable income stream. Uh, workers themselves can own a co-op. This type gives the workers direct voting rights and other responsibilities of ownership. And these co-ops select managers as they grow. Worker co-ops often have uh, their own kind of personality, which is reflected in how they do business. And that can be, um, that can encompass you know, food works and, and uh, a variety of labor. Groups of farmers can invest together to own a green mill and cut out an existing milling company in order to reduce costs. Artists can rent space to sell their creative work together. These are called producer co-ops. If we wanted to use the same business governance comparison, here I'm going to go way down the limit. Uh, we could consider the United Nations the largest producer co-op, bringing nations together to reduce climate pollution. Uh, there are now co-ops forming across the U.S. and around the world that have other creative solutions, sometimes called multi-stakeholder co-ops. Multi A relatively recent variant is to include investors in the ownership mix. This points to a central tension and difficulty for co-ops. While governments have a legal right to establish a stream of funding, businesses do not. And because cooperatives have a more complicated governance model than a more typical capitalist business, most banks are more reluctant to offer funding to them, preferring simplicity. Without access to capital, co-ops have a hard time getting traction, including investors as members. Including investors as members with voting power brings capital to the enterprise, but can be seen as going against the grain of the cooperative model, which favors direct democracy. This is particularly true if investors get votes concomitant with the level of their investment, which is the model for typical shareholder models of business. Now I'll bring it back down to what I know about less obscure. Maybe. I started a tech service business in our basement in 1985 with the idea of converting it to a worker co-op. I had gathered some computer knowledge and bought a collection of nameless clients from a friend I had worked for. He self-financed the sale, and I was able to pay him back from the proceeds of the service contract over a year with enough left to start to raise the family, so I didn't need to go to a bank. The business grew slowly. As a service business, I didn't have to go to a bank. I just hired people when the workload and income allowed it. At a certain point, we needed to move from the house and rented space in the Tacoma High Rise, a few doors up the street from here. Uh, and because we were profitable and because I had some real estate background, I started thinking about building an office building for us to move into. At the same time, we were continuing to prepare to convert to a cooperative. However, banks, being unfamiliar with co-ops, wouldn't lend to us. So I kept sole ownership in order to convince state financial lenders and banks to lend me the money personally. They were particularly interested in lending to a business that would occupy owned real estate, not just to a co-op, just not to a cooperative. Once the building was built and the company moved in, we became a co-op. And later I left the company but continued to manage and own the building. And because my name and house were on the notes, the banks were willing to let the financing stand. That service business was able to grow. But many retail and other co-ops have great trouble accessing capital. Fund flow. When banks are not friendly to co-ops, those companies can suffer. One would expect credit unions to lend vigorously to cooperatives because they themselves are member cooperatives owned by the depositors. However, that is often not the case as the banking industry is, in uh, my opinion, quite, quite cutthroat. U.S. banking laws are restricted and underwriters are much more likely to lend to individuals with significant there are places in the world with a high concentration of cooperatives, like the Basque Country or the Emilia Romano section of Italy. In those places, there are banks that, dedicate, that are dedicated to nurturing and developing cooperatives, specializing in co-op lending. Uh, relatively few places in this world have that level of cooperative consciousness. Some banks in this country specialize in agricultural lending, and there are programs to help the many in peril of small farms. The Affordable Care Act set up a network of cooperative healthcare markets across the U.S. when it was passed, but those co-ops were hobbled by the actions of big insurance and driven into oblivion. What is needed is an attitude of creative risk to fully embrace the potential of cooperative management. I'm hopeful that this discussion of public banking will address some of those difficulties, at least in theory, and shed light on the way forward. Uh, Steve.
Steve Sutson. Steve and I are uh, the steering committee of the DC Public Banking Center. Steve has been a, a long-time activist in DC and elsewhere on uh, clean energy and affordable housing. Thank you. So I realize this may be politically incorrect, but I have handouts. Um, <laughs> there's um, a two-sided um, handout that's fairly um, detailed, and I don't have enough for everyone. And there's a very brief summary of that on the back of these postcards. So if you could choose according to your um, wishes, and uh, if you don't want paper, our website is DC. So I want to talk, I'm going to try to avoid repeating uh, some of the great information uh, that's already uh, been uh, presented and talk a little bit more about what we're doing specifically in DC and then if I have time I will um, look at um, the uh, German public banking sector which is two thirds of uh, the German um, banking sector. Um, completely befuddles me and, and uh, comparing it to the American system, but maybe we'll have a little time to talk about that. So we've been working in DC for several years now to establish a, a public bank that is in essence a commercial bank um, owned entirely by DC government. So if you would, um, obviously in DC we're concerned about uh, governance issues and Issues of corruption, I think, are on our um, um, in the front of our mind, and yeah. so we are. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about governance, but first I want to talk about the program. I think that is really critical when we're talking about public banking is to talk about what the lending programs of the public bank would be. And so in DC, we're thinking that our top priorities are environmental sustainability affordable housing, and small and medium uh, business lending, and specifically those areas that are not being backed by commercial banks currently. And so it's a bit of a, it's finding the niches that are not being served by the current commercial banking sector that we're interested in. And so for instance, uh, and we do have a green bank in DC as well, so there's some, um, there'll be some negotiation between the two entities about who can want, but frankly, the, the need is so great that, frankly, it doesn't matter if there are two organizations, even if they're both public, um, doing this type of lending, because the, the need for lending in these areas is, is so extreme that it would, frankly, make sense to have multiple institutions that are thriving and filling specific so um, in terms of environmental sustainability, really, I, I think the top uh, need in DC is, um, is um, building efficiency. Um, that's really the top energy uh, use in the city. And so the, the retrofits that would build, bring our current building stock up to, I'd say, net zero or, or net positive energy, I think looking at, and uh, many of those are very bankable solutions, so there's a um, return on investment and to the bank, and there is also a, um, a benefit to property owners in terms of costs and utility savings that would be reduced by uh, building efficiency. Um, renewable energy would be critical as well, it's not as um, viable generally as a lending opportunity, but in DC we have, I think, the best um, solar renewable energy credits in the country, so um, we would be doing very well in DC to, to lend, and I think with the, uh, with the reduction of federal um, subsidies, the tax credits for renewable energy, I think it also opens up some opportunities. I think finance um, solar um, in a way that um, is owned and benefits the community for the duration of the, of the project. So I think there's actually some opportunities there. Um, 
Um, in terms of um, affordable housing, uh, we're looking at a, I feel, a real crisis of uh, a political crisis and, and a housing crisis in the city, and looking to other models that might uh, take a, a, a real um, bite out of the um, affordable housing crisis. We're interested in the social housing model that's uh, in existence in, throughout Europe. Um, uh, we're mainly interested in, I'm personally mainly interested in the Vienna model with some adaptations to the United States and to DC, which has also a, a history of limited equity co-ops and um, other types of affordable housing. We have a community land trust. So it would pull um, privately owned um, land and housing out of the private sector and put it into a land trust for community benefit for in perpetuity. So it, it would really uh, decommodify housing, which is, I think, the direction we need to go if we're going to avoid the, the constantly escalating crisis in, uh, of, of, of housing um, in a market that is um, virtually all increasingly um, and then in terms of small business lending, um, we don't have detailed plans, and I'll talk a little bit more about where we are in the process in a minute. We don't have detailed plans, but we're looking at a secondary market that could be created for the community development financial institutions that already exist in D.C. There's about five or six of them in D.C. They're um, of various shapes and sizes, but they are essentially community, nonprofit operated um, financial institutions that are already doing small business lending and we're looking um, for the opportunity to create a secondary market for their loans. So the public bank could buy the, would, could buy their loans and there's actually a, a buyer, a, a permanent buyer for the loans, um, a, a, um, a, a private foundation that is deeply endowed the public bank could act as the facilitator for that transaction. There could be other things, and just to give you a sense of where we are in the process, we had a council, a DC council member, um, get interested in public banking and um, sort of got out ahead of us where we were in the process in terms of um, wanting to do a feasibility study. Um, so money got put in DC. Uh, DC's budget um, uh, last year or the previous year, and that went through went through the DC Department of Insurance, Securities, and Banking, and um, sort of got um, put into a contractual vehicle that was easy for the city to use, and we ended up with a feasibility study that was not done by anyone with banking experience. And so you can kind of imagine how well that went. A lot of good information got collected with um, uh, public hearings and interviews and focus groups and other things. So there's some good information that we'd like to gather, but then put it into our own feasibility study moving forward. Who was um, the council member? Um, David Grosso. He's also leaving the council, so you won't hear about that after that. Um, and then, uh, I don't know whether I should talk about, well, I don't know. I can talk about Germany's banking center, but maybe maybe I should spend a minute first talking about, if we have time in the questions and answers, I'll talk about that. But in terms of governance, we're looking at a, um, a three-tiered um, governance system. So there would be a commission of people like Say the mayor or the chairman of the council, maybe the we don't have a, we do have a treasurer, the CFO is what it's called in DC for the the city. Maybe those three people on the commission, and the role of those people is to appoint a board of directors. And the board of directors is really more people with banking, lending, and borrowing expertise in the areas that uh, of the lending. And then the, the and they would be with they would be responsible for hiring and firing the um, CEO, and there would be other staff obviously at the bank would be running the bank. And then finally, there's a community advisory board 
that we consider essential to making sure that the public bank remains focused on the uh, mission and the goals of the public as they evolve over time. So I just want to put that out as an idea that um, like if you were interested in working with the county and doing something um, similar, um, I'd be happy to share all the information that we've put together over time. But just as a, as a potential governance model for a public bank that is a commercial bank, but we want um, to be focused on the public mission. So I'll leave it at that if we have time in the Q&A, if anybody's interested, or afterwards I can talk about Kermit's public banking system. It's multi-level and quite, quite interesting. Great, thank you. <laughs> Our final speaker this morning on the panel is Thomas Bayo, speaking of CEOs. He is the inaugural CEO of the market. So we have to wait the couple of documents and we'll talk a little bit to them to try to do something to familiarize yourself Kind of so, uh, first off, we're not a bad paper. Okay? Uh, we're a green bank, and a green bank is a entity that there's a number of there's about a dozen of them around the country. Most of them are statewide. We are the first global green bank set up, and their function is to be a financial intermediary, a financial partner with a private capital. Group. So we kind of sit in between what you might think of as the public banking and the commercial banking. Commercial banking is a highly regulated environment, right? So they got you to the Federal Reserve, FDIC, that oversees them. And so they have to function and manage their business according to that regulated environment. Public banking would be of a similar nature with a different set of requirements. Uh, commercial banking uses private capital as its resource to do its lending. You're some of that private capital, you put money in there as a deposit or checking, they take that money and they put it out in loans, they take that interest, they pay themselves back, they pay their operating costs and they pay their investors. Commercial banking works with private capital. Public banking works more with public capital, appropriated dollar bonds and so forth. Green banks work with a different set of capital. Uh, most green banks do not look at public dollars, appropriated dollars or that, as their capital source. They look at other sources. Uh, a lot of that comes out of the utilities. So in the Connecticut, uh, the ratepayers pay a fee, and that fee gets uh, sent to the, uh, to the Connecticut Green Bank, and that's their source of capital for doing their business. Um, in the case of uh, D.C., it's coming from a different fund, the solar fund that they have that they're translating back, those receipts back to the D.C. Green Bank, so it's not appropriated dollars there either. In the case of the Montgomery County Green Bank, we got our capital, if you recall, the Pepco and Exelon merged, and that created a concern among jurisdictions that uh, there would be less attention paid to ratepayers in the Pepco market because Exelon sits in Chicago and they're not going to pay attention. And so there was a settlement reach between Exelon uh, and uh, Prince George's District of Columbia and Montgomery County uh, to pay a certain fee to those counties to be supportive of energy efficiency renewable energy. Montgomery County, in its very progressive wisdom, decided rather than using that capital and spending it out, that they would invest it in a green bank. And so they actually created the institution of a green bank. That's the Montgomery County Green Bank. Um, we were actually formed in 2016, I came on board in 2017, and out of that settlement resources, the county had committed $14 million to the Montgomery County Green Bank as its capital source to do its business. So, that's the money that we had. It didn't come from the ratepayers, it came from the settlement. It didn't come from the county council, they did not appropriate us anything. So there's a benefit to that. If you get appropriated dollars, there's a lot of strings that come attached to that. Given this was not appropriated dollars, we don't have a lot of strings back in the county in terms of you know, their regulatory environment or procurement. We get to operate independently. So we are a nonprofit 501c3 with an independent board of directors, two of which are county, the Department of Finance and the Department of Environmental Protection, but the other nine members are all private sector members. So we operate independent. That doesn't mean we operate independent from what the county's goals are. It just means we don't have to have the, the oversight of county government over 
business, which allows us to work in a more independent relationship with the private capital markets. So Green Bank's job is not to be a lender. Our job is to bring much more private capital into the energy efficiency renewable energy marketplace. We've got 14 million. That could go quite quickly. Our job is to take 14 and turn it into 100 million. Right? So bringing in a lot more private capital to the energy efficiency renewable energy marketplace. So how do we do that? So we go out there and we say, okay, our focus is energy efficiency renewable energy. That's the environment we want to have more lending and investment. We know that marketplace, we understand that marketplace, we recognize we invest in energy efficiency, we invest in renewable energy, your operating costs are going to go down. You ran a business, you understand that, you understand your bottom line. What's a big part of your bottom line? Your utility costs, right? So if you can reduce your utility costs, you have a greater you know, operating income, you have a greater value in your business, value in your property. We understand that business. Commercial banking doesn't understand that business. They say, okay, you make that investment, I'm going to lend to you on that, uh, and I'm going to ask you to put your full recourse behind it because I don't trust that that operating benefit actually exists. Until I, banking is one that builds off of understanding risk. And if they don't understand the risk, they charge. Okay. So, um, so we say, look, you invest in that, you're going to get an energy savings. That energy savings is a benefit to you as a business, to you as a homeowner. Take that into account and give benefit to homeowners and businesses for that reduced risk. Lending says. I don't see that, I don't have enough data to understand that, I'm not doing that. So our job is to say, we believe that that's going to happen. We're going to stand behind that risk. We're going to put our capital behind your bank, and if you have that loss, you come to us and you ask us to pay you for that loss. Okay? We put a small amount of capital behind that, they put out the full amount of the loan, and we ask them, okay, we're not going to do this for nothing. Right? We're going to put our money behind you for risk. So you're going to change some of your product terms to make that a better product for the consumer or the commercial business out there to take that loan run. And so we give them a risk, we risk their portfolio. We say, okay, you're going to change some of your loan terms. In commercial banking, we have, you know, we're going to say, you know, you're going to make that an unsecured loan so that this business doesn't have to put another piece of debt on its property. And you're just going to make an unsecured loan. You're going to get it 100% financing. You're going to go out 12 years on the term so that the energy savings can match the, the debt service on that. Um, and you're only going to base it on the credit of the institution. You're not going to go through some exercise to underwrite the energy savings. And for that, you're going to price that at the same price you would price a secured loan. A secured loan means a mortgage, right? You take a mortgage, you get a great rate on that because if you don't pay, they're going to come and take your property. An unsecured loan says, you don't pay, I'm just going to come after you as an individual and ask you to pay. That always costs more if you go in the bar, right? Because they're banking on you, they don't have an asset to go after, right? So we say, no, we're going to put our money behind that, you're going to offer an interest rate that's just as favorable as if you get a mortgage. And so this is how a Green Bank operates. We operate behind the scenes, we don't operate as a, as a lender to the homeowner or lender to the business, we operate as a partner to the financial institutions that exist out there. And by being a partner with them, they use their capital in the, in the lending environment. They, they put their risk on the line for the most part. We don't take 100% of that risk. We share 80-20. So if we take 100%, we have very bad lending practices going on because they say, yeah, I have no risk in this. We share 80-20. We say, we'll take 80%. You take 20. That's enough to keep their eye on the ball. We don't want excessive risk. <coughs> um, so that's the partnerships that we're about and, 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 and operate under. Because 14 million can go in a, in a, in a moment. So, so that's the structure of the Green Bank. We're a nonprofit. We're a 501c3 member member board. Um, we're trying to leverage ourselves six to one. And if you turn this on, on the back side, these are the products that we've sort of been working on. It takes a little while to get these things up and running, but so far we have two projects, two products available, and a couple more coming in. We launched with a commercial product. We've got two lenders, Revere Bank, three lenders, two Revere Bank, the Team Economic Development Corporation, and the Central Capital. They're the front face lenders to the marketplace. 
They're the ones that originate the loans to the customers. Our agreements will carry each of them. If the loans they originate fail, they come and look at me to pay them. We've, I had two loans closed on that. One just recently to come over the condominiums that are right here in town. Uh, we went, it was a $1.5 million project. We put $1.2 million into that uh, in order to help that condominium change out its entire uh, heating and cooling systems. Um, so that's up and running, and it's now out. And we're just now, as of Monday, put a residential product in the marketplace. We work with two credit unions, Clean Energy Credit Union, the NASA Credit Union, there are no lenders <coughs> on this. We stand behind in the same way those lenders if they originate those loans. So that's now out there available. We work only to authorized contractors that we approve, and we want to make sure the work being done is a good quality set of work, and that we understand we kind of sort of vetted those contracts. So that's now available. We're running a community solar project that will actually happen just down East West Highway. That should happen this spring. Uh, it's going to be the first of its kind of a low mod community solar project here. We'll have 100 subscribers, 30% of which will be low mod subscribers. Um, and that will have a launch this spring. Uh, we're also developing a commercial solar power purchase agreement. It's a very complicated thing, but it, it basically allows for nonprofits to install solar on their property at no cost and have a price that they would pay for the generation of that equivalent to what they would pay the utility company and hold that constant so that over a 20-year period they have a managed operating expense and if utility prices escalate, they don't have to risk it. Uh, and then we've been working in affordable housing as well, but I'll leave that for questions. But, so, we're not a bank, we're a financial intermediary, and our job is to work with financial partners and get a great, much more amount of our capital led in the market. I've got a lot of questions, but I'm going to restrain myself. I'm just going to ask one before I open it up to uh, everyone here who doesn't have a mouthful. Uh, so uh, it seems like it's generally a good idea of this sort of alternative banking strategy you know, with public funds and you uh, support uh, social, desirable social outcomes. Um, are there natural allies? Are there also any potential adversaries to advancing this? Um, you know, what, the one thing that occurs to me is that nonprofit organizations do a lot of uh, social good in our communities. They don't generally own a lot of the wave assets. Uh, some do, but that's not typical. Um, they do have an income stream, but I think they find it difficult to raise money for programs sometimes, and they're, uh, they're one likely uh, group that would be interested in seeing this kind of asset available, um, or this, you know, this kind of funding available. But are there other natural allies or enemies of the public bank that you all can think of? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think there, one of the interesting things about public banking, I think, is how much of a consensus building it speaks to a lot of different issues at the same time. So like we're here to talk today, I think focus on um, climate and how to build resilient economies and kind of also within the cooperative sphere. Um, it's kind of another intersection. Um, we've already talked about housing a bit, housing justice. Um, I think it's interesting uh, if you want to create a little historical narrative of how, how does public banking kind of become an ascendant idea right now? Um, but coming from uh, you know, there's Occupy Wall Street, everyone's mad at the banks, um, and then it's like, but what can we do about it? Um, and then that translates into kind of the movements that come about um, prior to 2016, and then there was a Standing Rock protest um, against the Dakota Access Pipeline, and part of that was creating um, it through the, the solidarity movements across the country was asking your cities and state governments to divest from Wells Fargo, which is one of the main funders of the Dakota Access Pipeline, and so cities in California, specifically LA, uh, Davis, and Seattle, uh, Washington, um, divested from Wells Fargo, and they took their city funds out of it to put pressure on them to, to defund the Dakota Pipeline. Then the question becomes, what do we do about it? What do we, like, what do, we do with our money? We can just put, take it out of there, but then we gotta put it in some other bank. Right? And so the natural extension of that is we should create a public bank, right? Um, and so I think indigenous justice is also a natural ally that's a really important connection. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting natural allies and intersections. Um, 
so I would say, just to, going back to my presentation, I would say that any nonprofit that owns a facility, a building, or, or a space, any type of space, could benefit by um, public finance for um, to make their buildings more efficient. I'll leave it at that because I want to focus on some of the enemies that um, that um, you probably encounter. I would say the banking industry is, is has their radar. Try to take it down directly, and if that doesn't work, they'll wait to co-opt it. And so the board of directors, um, they'd like to be on the board of directors. They'd like to make the public bank serve um, the existing banking infrastructure. The North Dakota model uses um, local banks as the, the, the <coughs> lenders for uh, most of the loans, but um, they would like um, additional financial services provided to them. So I think there's like some some mission that will start to occur as um, public banks get established, and indeed that's uh, what happened in our pizza bowl. So the mission got completely flipped on its head, and that it suddenly became a whole, uh, kind of a wholesale bank to serve the banking industry. So I, I would say the banking, insurance, the financial sector in general is. Um, quite leery of this whole public interest banking model and will do will use every tactic in the book to take it down or to corrupt it and use it for their own purposes. Um, I would say in general there's some risks uh, working even with local government uh, which is stretch for dollars and would love to find another way to figure out how to pay for things that they can't pay. The San Francisco Bank feasibility study. Um, the, um, the the politicians um, sort of made the feasibility study take on a a an unprofitable uh, lending program that benefited small and minority contractors that could be um, recruited to serve to to uh, to bid on city uh, contracts. And they weren't viable businesses yet, and the lending program actually lost the money. But the politicians were determined to foist that on the public bank because they didn't have money or they didn't want to appropriate money and put it into capacity building for small and minority businesses. They wanted the public bank to pay for it. So I would say that there's a huge danger in politicians trying to figure out like they don't have enough money to appropriate, so let's let's put it on the public bank and make the public bank lose money on this particular program. And I'd say the same thing, the same community pressures are, are going to be an impact. Like for affordable housing, well, can't the bank make a, a loan at 0% interest? Well, maybe, maybe not. Certainly a bank is not going to be profitable if all of the lending programs are done at 0% interest. In Germany, there were, there's a national um, uh, bank um, um, funded under the Marshall Plan, and, and then state-level banks in each of the, the, the German states. And the, many of those state-level banks, or two or three of those state-level banks, went bankrupt or had such serious financial difficulties because they engaged in lending activities that were not sustainable. They either lost money or didn't make enough profit that they could sustain the bank's operations. So I say that it's a very real risk that we can't overplan us on what public banks can do. I mean, it's it's a for-profit enterprise, and if we're going to, my goal would be for it to, like to start it out in DC at fifty million dollars and grow it over time. But that that assumes that we're making a profit every year, and that we're we're um, putting those profits, keeping those profits in the public bank and building it over time. So. Like the, the wish list of people like us in the room is also a, a risk for the public bank. So we all need to be aware of that. Yeah. Any thoughts on that? Can I respond to that? Well, I want to make sure we have plenty of other uh, yeah. time in the room here. Uh, Tom, uh, I have a quick question for you and for you, Steve. Tom, how's the uh, reception been in the private investors in, in investing in your enterprise? So the so our partners are the 
not investors in us. Right? So they're the, the lending environment, right? So um, when we first started approaching them, there was a, it was hard for them to understand it. It was hard for them to sort of appreciate what the outcome would be from mm -hmm. it. Um, like changing their operating models in terms of thinking about another partner mm -hmm. in it. So it was tough to sort of get some of those initial conversations. Not uh, yet, you know, success brings interest, right? So now that we've had a couple of loans that we closed, we've had more interest from other financial partners to begin to partner with us. Did you have a certain amount of uh, goal to, to uh, raise for funding? So we're, we're not authorized at 23 million. 23 million. Okay. And we're trying to initially get some get that deployed, and then begin to leverage that by going out to get other investors to invest in. We don't anticipate the county providing a whole lot more additional capital, so we're looking for outside capital to do that. Um, most outside cap this capital comes with no cost of funds, right? So we're able to sort of use that and to the sustainability nature. Our job is not to burn through that money, paying our expenses. That our job is to make returns on that, enough to pay some of our costs as well. The next set of capital we get will come with cost of funds, right? So if you go to other financial institutions like the Wells Fargo, a PNC, uh, in the CDFI world, that's how they get a lot of their capital, but it comes with some generally a better favorable rate, but you got to start there and then lend above it. So right now we're working to get this first set of capital deployed in the marketplace and then begin to look at other capital investors and recycle. And Larry, do you mind if I do a real quick follow up with Steve? You had mentioned that there's a foundation out there willing to basically act as a secondary market for lending. Uh, how viable is that? And well, it's, it's been really intriguing. Years yeah. Since we've talked to them, but they were very interested. They had already begun um, discussions with the Department of Small Local Business Development to provide loan guarantees um, for the loans that were coming through um, the um, community development financial institutions. So. You know, it's not a fresh um, conversation, I have to say, and things change all the time within organizations, but they seem quite interested and ready to sign on the dotted line. But it, it did depend on a loan guarantee from uh, D DSLVD, um, but they needed a partner to make the transaction happen. It was just sort of a, a pass-through entity that could um, consolidate the loans, uh -huh. season loans, and then they'd take them at a certain point, maybe one or two years. It's a big piece of the puzzle, but it's yes. in your yes. Interesting. Well, I wanted to ask more about the time capacity building issue that you're talking about and what other kind of reparative elements might be necessary in a system like this because it seems like there's still so much capital that people need up front to, to start a business, to buy real estate, or you know, to begin something like this. And um, the public bank might not be able to put all that up front and also
that regulation is not being enforced correctly. And there's like all sorts of loopholes that people are using, like large corporations are setting up a storefront that looks like a small business, but it's really like one guy, you know, with a cell phone and a, and a PO box, and that's a pass-through into that larger corporation, and that guy is bidding on contracts and getting and winning the prize <coughs> small local businesses. And, and then this big corporation behind it is, is basically getting all the work all the, and all the, um, the, the actual contract is going to the corporation. So, like, we need stronger enforcement of existing regulations, and that narrowly is defeated by the council to correct that. So, like, I think some council members need to be replaced. <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll just add that in, in uh, Maryland there was a yeah, I it's still there called Neighborhood Business Works, part of the Maryland government, and um, it focused on how money could be used to to help a particular area, a particular neighborhood, or what have you. So that's a little bit different focus if you have that you lay that on top. And I'll, I'll just add to that too with respect to Maryland. I know that there's been numerous instances where the Maryland General Assembly has done line items to support a business if there's a good business plan and it's kind of tied into the larger economic development strategy of the community or the, or the county or the municipality. Question back. To my knowledge, the most recent effort in the Maryland General Assembly to promote public banking was Bill 794 in the 2016 year, and it promoted two things, and I think really excellent. One was to authorize the chartering of public banks in political subdivisions, that means a municipality like Dakota Park or a county. And second, it called for a review and exploration of, the, of what would be needed to create a public bank at the state level. Of course, the bill never made it out of committee. And so my question is, is anybody aware of any other more recent legislative initiative this year during this legislative session? And if so, or if not, who might be able to promote that? So the Moon, Stuart Vaughn, whoever, Vaughn Stewart, whoever it may be. Um. So this year there isn't anything. I had talked to both Lord Charcuti and, and Bond Stewart about this, and um, both of them are interested in it. And I think they see that experience from the past couple of years and are saying, you know, give us the ability to do this. Uh, Delegate Charcuti is on the Economic Matters Committee, so she could introduce a bill. Um, if And I think that this is actually my central argument that I didn't really get to make in the beginning, is that a public banking, <laughs> So when a public bank, you need a movement behind it, right? I think we've kind of seen how it's it's a tool, it's a means to an end, it's not a good in and of itself. You can have a public bank that doesn't actually end up doing good things, like for example, some cases in North Dakota, the Bank of North Dakota. And the people who are at the table when we're creating the movement for a public bank are going to shape what that public bank ends up looking like, right? So this could be how the bank is governed, you know, how what are the accountability and transparency mechanisms, how is the community represented within the board of bank, um, how is the bank capitalized, where does that money come from, it's kind of a political decision, right, um, what what are the loans going to go to is also a political decision, because that's kind of the constituencies of the bank itself, so if you do um, housing, sustainability, and small uh, businesses as your, as your lending, those are the people who are going to be the advocates for the bank, um, and depending on what you choose to do, um, that's, that's who it's going to end up being, um, and then where does the profit go is also you know, a political decision. And so my argument would be, as we're thinking about winning a public bank for Maryland or for political subdivisions, um, we have to be cognizant of and intentional about who is um, joining that movement and how are we building uh, constituencies into that movement to win a public bank on a state level, because you do need state legislation. And I would say to that, um, some, some clarity, I think, would probably be needed in terms of people don't really understand. Like, I, I watched the testimony for that bill, and I think it was interesting that people kind of got caught up in, like, wait, are we creating a state bank or are we creating municipal banks? I don't think there was as much clarity um, on, like, which, which one is this doing. I don't know if you can do both at the same time. 
um, because they're both trying to do a state level task force and enable legislation within the same bill. I don't know if that's possible. I think that's something like the movement would have to deliberate about and kind of land on is like very clear, we want you know Montgomery County Bank or we want like Bank of Maryland. Like you, you have to be able to like argue for it forcefully with movement power because otherwise like I think it kind of gets lost. And you can see like you know uh, Delegate Gutierrez is the one who introduced it and um, she gives her testimony and then right afterwards the like the banking association of Maryland comes in like the <laughs> the three top people within it and then they're like this is the death of banking in Maryland. Like it's very funny. <laughs> Um, but like the you know the, the lobbying against you is going to be too strong, and if you don't have democratic movements that are fighting for the bank and are clear about what they're fighting for, then you're not going to win. Um, and I think that that's a really important part of this. And I'll just pitch uh, like my my goal in doing this work right now is to try to help build um, a Maryland Public Banking Alliance. So if anyone's interested in becoming either co-organizer as an organization that would be interested in getting involved with this, pushing for a bill in 2021. Kind of like a multi-year strategy, um, we can talk afterwards. Can I just follow up on that? Quickly? Can I just follow up? Quickly. So in, in talking with the county executive, who's very much in support of, of this public banking initiative, I'm sure he was spoken with him as well, one of the easiest ways to do, create a public bank, whether it's for climate, whether it's for housing, is actually the conversion of uh, credit unions, existing credit unions that have a declared purpose and that are often looking for additional source of revenue and clientele that can join us. And that was just part of the discussion we had about that share. Signal Bank, Signal Credit Union was started by Verizon and it's sort of, um, when, when Verizon, when they parted ways with Verizon, they left, lost a bit of their uh, forward motion. So that, I, that's what comes to mind when we talk about converting Um, I was at Rhizome last night at the Extinction Rebellion um, launch meeting for the, this area. And um, it, it just, I'm applying that logic, it, you know, sort of came to see that as like, they are the enzyme that's wanting to break down the system. And then we've got other enzymes that want to build the system. And um, this, um, you're talking, what we've been talking about is how to build, how to, you know, how to provide loans. What about the, you know, divestment movement? That, I mean, people want to take their money out of Wall Street. And I keep getting this question, you know, where, where should I do my banking? Or, you know, there's the, you know, solo 401k, self-directed IRA sort of coming onto people's radar and more and more. Um, that, you know, we can take our you know, investment nest egg and, you know, put it, um, in a, you know, in our local regional economies, and, but what vehicles can banks provide to make that easy for people? Is, is it, you know, should we all be using credit unions, or what's the simple answer? I'll just go out and I might say credit union as yes, number one. If you, if you if look at all the services and, you know, lending products that they have, whatever you need, and shop around. This is like the the um, the concentration, the highest concentration of credit unions in the United States is DC. So, credit union. Number two, local. Bank. If you can't find everything you need, go to a local bank. Beyond that, it's a big world. No one really knows a you know, recent headline of BlackRock, which is a you know, largest invest equity investor out there, changing its its approach and being out there saying sustainability has got to be a key component to our investing. That's a big voice to be out there you know, at Wall Street to be looking at that. Now, how many others will fall in line? I don't know, but that's a, that's a very significant voice of change. Now, they're not out there not to make money, but they're out there to say what we invest in has to have that component to it. That's a big step forward for the Wall Street. Um, just to follow up on that, and I have a, a question. Um, Wikipedia is socially responsible investing. Uh, Williams College about in that. Late. Could you talk a little louder? You could. Wikipedia is socially responsible investing. To, to Suzanne's question, who's out there? Uh, I know some graduates from Williams in the A's former firm, specifically to not have yeah you know, divestment. We back when I was in college, of course, 
the big divestment thing was South Africa. Um, but my questions are, are about the banking. And Dan, uh, you and I had a conversation about this at one time, about the co-op, the food co-op, and which is part of Co-op America, being an entity that could possibly, here at Co-op Park, create its own credit union. And I don't know if that's possible, um, but that, to me, would be one way to be even more local, because having our money invested in, in locally is a more sustainable economy than having it invested elsewhere. And the second part of the question is, purchasing power. Can our county, I guess this is to you, can our county, like Green Bank, purchase solar panels in a manner which is so such a large purchase, and then through the bank, or the, the Green Bank, redistribute them at a small markup, but still a savings to the consumers of the county. Is that a possibility? I'll, I'll talk briefly about the co-op, about the co-op and um, creating the co-op because of consolidation, and, or creating a credit union, which is the consolidation of the credit union um, um, environment, partly because of technology and other efficiencies, is hard. It's hard to start a co-op. It doesn't mean you can't find a way to um, to create funding for four small co-ops, and that's a good conversation to have. Credit union? Uh, if, to gather money together as a credit union, to create a credit union is difficult because there's been a consolidation in the credit union industry. There were, I don't know how many, hundreds in, the, in 20 years ago, and now there are far fewer because credit unions are consolidated. Partly because of that, it's hard to start a new one. The restrictions are significant. But that doesn't mean you can't find a way to provide money for co-ops. I think that was the question, or if it was the question. Um, it's not a banking institution. And that speaks a little bit to where do you put your 401k money. But that's a tricky, I don't understand it very well, but I think there's potential there. Interesting concept relative to procurement from the county. I don't know their procurement approach. I don't work within the county structure, but interestingly enough, right, the county council is they're looking at various legislation now about you know requiring solar on, on poles and so forth. And you know, is it a concept they should be entertaining right now? I don't know. I mean, question is, can they procure enough? And then the risk that you know they're using you know, they, you know they're using public dollars to buy that and then have to manage it as a as a sale, I mean, that, that, that's, a, that's a different role for the county to play. Interesting concept. Though. Well, there is a model, but it's not exactly the same, and it's the Rainscape program, which provides a lot of uh, incentives and, and possibilities to get your rain barrels, your trees, right. what, whatnot. There's, there is a model. It, it could be used, uh, transition over to, or our city here at Colonel Park, hopefully, could take a look at, at, at that possibility. You have it in the private sector, DC Solar, uh, you know, you have people aggregating cooperatively on a block to get a block for the solar on the row houses. I mean, but I would, I would like to see, because we are McCormick County, because we have Green Bank, I would like to see your entity be a mechanism to get that kind of thing to happen. Because it's also, you, you, you were replacing, you put your funding money, the city wants to get rid of gas furnaces and boilers, and you did a project right here in Tacoma Park to upgrade um, an entire building. So. It looks like, you know, you're the, the only thing that exists right now in that direction. So I'm hoping you succeed and you can grow into something bigger and our city can elect to use your system more yet. We've got uh, 9 o'clock. Um, maybe time for one more question. Uh, there's been a persistent hand back there. Sure. Well, Barton uh, just in the last few seconds asked part of my question, which is, uh, I, I uh, love what's here and now, which is the Green Bank, and uh, you mentioned taking additional outside investment. You mentioned Wells Fargo, which is very dirty money. Uh, <laughs> so uh, what about community investments if someone has $5,000, $50,000, $100,000? $100, uh, sell shares to the security and perhaps even consider uh, allowing those to be locally designated within the county, maybe, maybe not. I know, for instance, that, uh, that uh, the condominium building that you mentioned financing, which is great, has a twin, which is a rental building with many low-income tenants. So there's also an equity question there. And there would be a desire for people in the community with some financial resources uh, 
without waiting for the creation of, green, of uh, community banking enablement and then the banks themselves to be able to invest and, and enhance your mission. So we're open to any public investment that wants to be made. We have the donation button. You can go and donate to us, and we'll look at it and put it into sort of the support of the operation we're doing. Um, we are. Banks don't usually take donations, they take investments that are right. yeah. I'm just saying, but right now we don't we, we don't have partnership agreements in place in order to take those kind of investments. So we can take donations at this point. I mean, we were approached with a hundred thousand dollar and we look at what kind of agreement we can put in place in order to take that investment. Uh, right now we've had one point two million of foundation dollars in the Those are you know grant dollars and which have a programmatic department and not a return department. So we're not going to look at anyone who's going to do that. But now we're set up to take donations. Uh, on the rental, we've been working uh, with rental properties in order to understand their needs. They're a little bit more complicated in terms of how they find themselves and how their capital works. Uh, many of them uh, look at the point of you know, rehabilitation at the time that they'll undertake those that so far, we've been working with entities that are doing it sort of as a retro mm -hmm. exercise. You know, multifamily is a big part of what we're focused on. We ran two technical assistance uh, uh, assessments on two affordable multifamily properties uh, with to understand their current conditions and give them a view of what their future conditions will be. And they're rolling those ideas into their refinancing so that they will actually improve the properties to the way we sort of advise them about what the students can look like. Definitely focus on the equity. Well, thanks. Uh, another round of applause. <laughs> researcher and um, has uh, done her master's thesis I guess, on um, the history of development and I think it relates directly to what we're talking about here. I still feel like I don't quite understand. I wanted to come out of today understanding like, okay, how are we going to get the money to do these projects that we want to do? Um, and, you know, maybe we just need to take the broader look. Um, you know, yeah, I like simple answers, but it's so complicated. Wait a minute, let me see if I have it here. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, uh, it seems like I might be able to, I'm sorry, I'm not from this area, but I might be able to also teach 
question. Um, uh, me and a friend, I was living in New Orleans for a while, and we worked on a project together. We were also engaged in kind of community grassroots development, and we put together a suite of posters kind of as a, a research and like theater and design projects that kind of narratively goes through the history of development and urbanization in New Orleans. And so I would like to share that with everyone. If all right, everybody who had all these things, please put them up here and we'll get it out to our email. <laughs>